Well, uh, I'm really looking forward to this, this new series, Amazing Grace, and getting into that as we head towards Easter. There's no topic I love more than this, I must admit. 25 years ago, Philip Yancey wrote a book, What's So Amazing About Grace. Uh, eight years after it was published, Christianity Today uh, ranked it as 17th of the 50 books that have most shaped evangelicalism. I mean, even today, what's so amazing about grace is in a lot of lists of best, popular, and most sold Christian books of all time. Yancey actually wrote the book in response to a question from former President Bill Clinton after his moral failure. And he asked the question, why do Christians hate so much? He didn't write the book to condone immorality. Instead, he noticed that many local churches at the time were focusing on exterminating immorality while ignoring grace. His concern was highlighted in a conversation with a prostitute in Chicago. She was in a crisis and weighed down by guilt of poor choices and pain she had caused. So a Christian invited her to church, but she responded, why would I want to go to church? I already feel terrible about myself, and they will just make me feel worse. Yancey set out to convince his readers that grace is our best word. It's central to the gospel, and it's what people crave most, yet expect least. It's the greatest gift the church can give to the world. The scandal of grace is a term coined by Yancey, and it means that Jesus can forgive even the worst of sinners, and he used the Apostle Paul as exhibit A. Maybe John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, could be exhibit B, the slave trader. Could you get worse, even possibly worse than a slave owner stole people from their freedom to be sold as animals to other people? Yancey quotes Christian counsellor David Siemens to emphasise the problem that needed the solution of grace. The two major causes of most emotional problems among evangelical Christians are these. The failure to understand, receive and live out God's unconditional grace and forgiveness and the failure to give out that unconditional love, forgiveness and grace to other people. Is... Yancey and Siemens right. Well, one thing's for sure. Grace really is amazing. If you were going to make up a religion, you wouldn't come up with grace. The unmerited favour of God received through faith in Jesus. I think I'd come up with eating a lot of chocolate. You should have to do that. But not grace. Grace. You would come up with a system of earning favour with God, a religion where only good people will make it. Grace isn't fair, that sinners can be forgiven and make it with God and good people could miss out. That faith not works is the access point of this amazing grace. Let me ask you a question as we begin this series. Is grace amazing to you right now? Is grace amazing to you? I mean, some of you are saying, yes, I am constantly amazed. I am full of gratitude every day. It only becomes more wonderful the longer I walk with Jesus. Others, you might say, it was amazing, but not so much now. I've lost the wonder, I've forgotten the wonder of grace. Perhaps there are some who are not that amazed due to a counterfeit version of grace. That you see this grace of God is more like an amazing loophole. You know, I can, I can get a free ticket to heaven and then while I'm waiting for that, I can just live for myself and however I want on earth. Or maybe it's an amazing mystery that You access through religious observation, maybe communion, or get a bit more grace, go through some rituals and save it up, and hopefully I'll get enough of it. You know, as we lead into Easter, my prayer is that everyone would be just amazed 
by God's grace. That the words would be all of our experience. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Is that anyone's story here today? (laughs) Many, many people. So Lord, teach us afresh about your amazing grace through this series into Easter, we pray. Amen. Well, the first message in this series is about the search for grace, and I could call it amazing treasure. Uh, When you think about searching for treasure, what comes to mind at at the moment? What is that priceless commodity that if found, it would be a game changer for you and maybe the one you love? You know, there's no shortage of memes around about the price of petrol. (laughs) I particularly... I particularly like the the guy taking the lady out to the BP because it's somewhere expensive. You said, take me somewhere expensive. (laughs) You know, when we think about finding treasure, most of us think about finding like hidden gold or gems or something like that. Um, I stumbled across that show, Opal, Outback Opal Hunters. Has anyone seen that show here today? No one, I'm the only pathetic person to watch that. And uh, I learnt, watching a few episodes of that, that 90% of the world's opals are in Outback Australia. And uh, some people try their hand at hunting for opals, fossicking in the Outback. Interesting, this brother and sister, Isaac and Sophia Andre, gave it a crack. And on their very first go, found 1.2 million worth of Yawa opals, only a couple of years ago. 900 k's west of Brisbane in outback Queensland. How about that? But before you pack up your car after church (laughs) and start heading out west, while some make some good money from their fines over many years, the majority actually, I learnt, don't find enough to actually change their lives, despite their tireless search for it. You know, most of us aren't going to be opal hunters, but many people are searching for treasure. To strike gold in some form and find valuable treasure that will make them perpetually happy for the rest of their lives. You know, maybe it's just that, striking it rich, you know, winning millions of dollars or something like that. That would would be it. Or maybe you think it's found in a particular set of experiences attached to a lifestyle, you know, to live over looking the best breach break, or snow fields, or the golf course. Or it's found in a relationship, uh, like a spouse that's going to tick all the boxes and meet all my needs. Perhaps the greatest treasure is achieving something notable, or it's living a long and healthy life. Or you might shake your head at that list and say, that's not a deal. Or the greatest treasure is that you are loved and adored by almost everyone. Whatever represents finding treasure is usually about what makes us happy and about getting what we really want in life. This treasure search, though, is often a source of frustration for many people. The years tick by, still searching, but still haven't found it. Or worse, you thought you found it, but it failed, or it was taken from you. The market crashed. The lifestyle wasn't filling that empty void. The relationships, relationships based on getting needs from somebody else actually don't work. You experience failure. You develop health problems despite your amazing diet and exercise program. You find self on yourself on the end of a conflict, or you're exhausted by years of just trying to prove yourself as worthy of love. It turns out that searching for some great treasure that brings the ultimate happiness is actually as elusive as finding opals in the outback. And that teaches us something that almost everyone is greatly overestimating the value of things in this world. And if that's the case, 
then the flip side must also be true that most people underestimate the value of finding Jesus and the real joy that comes from receiving his amazing grace. In fact, some people think of God more like a liability, not as a treasure. You know, to the religious, a necessary liability. To the irreligious, an unnecessary liability. But nothing could be further from the truth. And Jesus makes that clear in his parable in Matthew 13, 44 to 46. Just a few verses we're going to look at this morning. Jesus taught this parable. He said, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, He hid it again, and then in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had, and he bought it. It's clear enough that Jesus is teaching that the kingdom of heaven is really the greatest treasure a person could ever hope to find in this whole world. This parable actually sits between other parables, the parables of the wheat and the weeds and the parables, uh, parable of the net and the fish. And it's talking about this, this separation that happens when, at the end of all things when Jesus comes again, people divided into two groups, those who enter eternity without God and those who enter eternity with God. And which group you find yourself in depends on whether you receive Jesus as your greatest treasure in this life, as your Lord and your Saviour. And so the treasure represents the King and his kingdom of heaven, uh, our eternal home that Jesus came to give us the keys to. His first coming and sacrifice on the cross and resurrection opened the door for us to be able to enter in. It was actually 10 years ago in Last month, 2012, when we moved into 131 Upper Kedron Road for the first time. But we didn't get the keys to this property or ownership on this property until we'd signed the contract and paid the price and it was settled. And after that, we could take ownership. And I'll never forget the open the gates day when we got the kids to push open those gates and we celebrated entering onto this property and we prayed that these gates would always remain open forever, which expresses God's desire for all people to enter into his kingdom. How wonderful. Love that photo. Those kids are a bit older now. Moving into the kingdom of heaven is like that. Jesus has paid what's required, not us. But when we accept what he has done for us and enter into a relationship with him, as Lord and Saviour, we belong to God. This is the greatest treasure a person can ever find, salvation in Jesus. To receive it now, but to know that when I die, we're going to move into our real home, that this is not our real home here. And to do life following him on the way. You know, finding treasure in this parable told two stories. Jesus wanted his disciples to really get this with two stories. A man digging in a field and bang, he hits something hard. He drops to his knees, he removes it from the ground. Incredible treasure chest full of priceless items perhaps. And the contents were so valuable that he bought the field just to possess it. That's how valuable it was. Finding Jesus can be like an unexpected discovery sometimes for some. And maybe this is some here. You're just going about your normal life. Maybe you're working hard and then one day you stumble across grace. Your life collides with Jesus And you start uncovering more and more until you realize he is more amazing than you ever thought he was. And then there's the pearl merchant. Another dive. Another oyster to crack open. But then, wow, the biggest, purest pearl you have ever seen. One of a kind. He also needed to buy it more valuable than any other pearl that he'd ever seen. You know, some find Jesus like this, searching for meaning, for truth, start to investigate the claims of Christianity, take a closer look at Jesus, read the Gospels, and then 
in that process, he appears. A person of incredible beauty and majesty. There's no one like him. This is who I've been looking for. So it's true that some kind of stumble across the kingdom and it's like it finds them, but others are searching for something more and rewarded with finding Jesus. Regardless of how that connection is made, Jesus is the greatest discovery we can ever make in this life. Hear that today. He is the most valuable treasure, the pearl of great price. And for those who truly find him, they are always surprised with joy that he is actually better than they expected. Have you ever experienced a gift that turned out better than you expected? In 2017, Leanne and I turned 50 and celebrated our 25th anniversary, all within about three weeks. So we thought, we're going to go to Victoria and have a little bit of a holiday down there to celebrate. Started in Melbourne. When we were down there, our kids actually gave us a surprise gift. Um, Three envelopes. We had to open the first one on a particular day in Melbourne. And it gave us instructions that we would be picked up at a certain time of night. So we waited and we were picked up. The driver knew what was happening. We didn't know. And the driver picked us up and dropped us off at a building, the Eureka Tower. And so we opened the second envelope there and we were able to go up to the Eureka Tower and go out on that glass bottom floor where you look down and think you're going to die, but you don't. People pay a lot of money to have that experience. And uh, that was the second part of this gift. It's getting good. And then at a certain time, we could open the third envelope. We opened the third envelope, and it gave us direction to Heston Blumenthal's restaurant, of all places to go. We arrived, and there was a table set for us, and another envelope on the table wishing us happy birthday and happy anniversary. And then we started to feast. And we ate what looks like fruit and a steak. It was actually pate and bread and this incredible experience where the gift just ended up better than we expected so thank you Christy and my children I don't get those every year by the way but that was amazing the the gift began us getting ready jumping in a car the driver took us somewhere we didn't know where we would end up or the fullness of the gift at first but the more we discovered the better we realized it is this is what, like what happens when a person discovers the grace of God and enters into a relationship with Jesus. For those who are followers of Jesus, maybe you can relate to one of these treasure finders when you became a Christian. Maybe you were digging away, trying to work hard, be good enough for God, but you were never really sure how far you had to go and how it would go when you met him. You had a lot of fear which has now turned to incredible joy to live with the incredible grace of God, to be able to come confidently in his presence, as Henry reminded us this morning. Or you were searching intellectually, like my sister-in-law Sue. She was a science graduate. She searched for 19 years until her intellectual questions were satisfied enough to take a step of faith, and then she never and has never looked back. If I go back in history to an example of this, Martin Luther, the reformer, took his first mass as a monk in the Catholic Church, and he was overwhelmed by the gravity of the words he spoke. He led the congregation saying, we offer unto thee the living, the true, the eternal God, and then suddenly Martin froze. He couldn't go on, and he later wrote the reason why. At these words, I was utterly stupefied and terror-stricken. I thought to myself, with what tongue shall I address such majesty, seeing that all men ought to tremble in the presence of even an earthly prince? Who am I that I should lift up mine eyes and raise my hands to the divine majesty? For I am dust and ashes and full of sin, and I am speaking to the living, eternal, and true God. This glimpse of truth about the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man changed Luther forever. First was his search. Luther began to look for antidotes to his own sinfulness and guilt. 
He was already a monk, but he spent days in prayer and service. And still, as he looked at his life closely, he found sins in thought, word, and deed. And so in the monastery, Luther spent up to six hours a day confessing his sins to a priest. He fasted for days and refused blankets at night, believing that he earned merit with God through self-imposed suffering. One day he would proudly say, I have done nothing wrong today. But on reflection, he wondered if he had indeed fasted enough, prayed enough, suffered enough, served enough. During a visit to Rome, he climbed a staircase on his knees, saying a prayer on each step. The Catholic Church promised that this was a means of grace. But when he got to the top, he wondered aloud, who knows whether it is so? Luther later described this time of being in such torment that he even wished he wasn't created. So great was his despair of the guilt that he carried. Luther threw himself into study, hoping to distract himself by preparing a series of lectures on Psalms and Romans. And there, in the Word, he found the answer. He was disturbed by the justice of God, but then he read in Romans Paul's Word, the just will live by faith. And the penny dropped. The light came on. The treasure was uncovered. He made the connection. It's not by works that justification with God takes place. It's by faith in the work that Jesus has done for us. And in that moment of trusting Christ, he said, I felt reborn. And I've gone through open doors into paradise. Luther discovered the greatest treasure, the the pearl of great price, and his life was totally transformed. I love the quote that expresses it like this. Faith, he said, faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace, so sure and certain that a man could stake his life on it a thousand times. Amazing grace. God used Martin Luther to lead in the Reformation that sparked a revival and birthed the Protestant church, and a return to this message of amazing grace. Now that's a treasure that ended up so much more than he could have imagined. Have you found that treasure yet? Have you received this amazing grace? You don't have to live in fear of God because of the weight of guilt and endless striving to justify yourself. The priceless treasure has been uncovered. The oyster has been open, revealing the pearl of great price. And it's not just a message, it's a person, and his name is Jesus. The other point in the parable is how the treasure finders sell everything to possess it. The first sells everything to buy land to get treasure, the second to purchase the pearl. So Jesus is saying the treasure is so great that it's worth giving up anything to possess this. Jesus is telling this, this, this parable to his disciples, and they were men who had left everything to follow Jesus. And so this, this parable would have been a great encouragement. Sometimes it can be very costly being a follower of Jesus. And uh, you can experience suffering in life in a pretty major way, and somehow when you follow Jesus in the places he calls you to go. But Jesus tells us we need to remember that we have something of far greater value than what this life offers. Everything here can be taken away. A world war can happen. A market can crash. A natural disaster. A season of great persecution. All kinds of challenges and losses can come for us individually. And yet none of what we lose compares to the greatness of what we have received. And that's why Paul said, In Philippians, I consider all things as loss compared to the all supporting graceness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I just was reading this week that Franklin Graham, seven years ago, he held a crusade in in Lviv, Ukraine. And there was a stadium full of people. And he preached the gospel. And many people responded and received that amazing grace. Right now, there's a... This, that place is used as a field hospital for Samaritan's Purse to help those suffering from the war. But there's a video going around at the moment about that, 
that crusade seven years ago where there is a choir of 2,800 people, Christians, singing this choir, singing this song, Ukrainian Christians singing um, Agnes Day with Michael J. Smith on the keyboard. Incredible. You can look it up on YouTube and just watch the Ukrainian choir of this magnitude singing. And then Franklin Graham made a comment and he said, I wonder where they all are today. But one thing is for sure. Even though earthly homes and treasures can be destroyed, there is a treasure that can never be taken away. A hope that's priceless and eternal. There are many Ukrainians that have this greatest treasure. And yet there are many Australians living in different circumstances who don't. Maybe today you've forgotten about how great this treasure is if you're a follower of Jesus. How much God loves you and all he has done for you. Perhaps you have lost your joy because you're focused on earthly things to bring happiness that only Jesus can bring. Remember again today, if you love Jesus, that you have what can never be taken away. He is worth more than anything this world can offer. For those who are yet to follow Jesus, maybe working away at good works, maybe this is a new message for you, even today. Hoping that God will accept me one day. Or maybe you could be searching in all of the wrong places and you realize that. Well, Jesus brings a challenge because he loves you and he's glad you're hearing today and listening. To embrace, he invites you to embrace this treasure. But to embrace it, you need to be prepared to let go of anything to follow him. If Jesus isn't valuable to us, we reveal it by trying to keep him in this convenient place or to try and use him for our own purposes rather than follow him. It's easy to treat God like many things in life that are useful to get ahead. But like the pearl of great price, Jesus is not like anyone or anything else. He's incomparable. And one thing he didn't leave himself open to is for people to think you could buy favor with him or just have a little of him. It's all of him for all of us. You know, maybe like Luther, it starts with that feeling of the seriousness of our sin, the gravity of the justice of God and our deserving of separation and judgment, but then we realize the futility and inability we have to try and pay God off. It's in that place of the offer of amazing grace where the pearl is gleaming through a crack in the oyster or like the treasure that is sparkling in the surface of the dirt that is hidden. It's it's there. Maybe you can even see it today and it's becoming clearer. It's for you to take hold of, to let go of your old life, to embrace this amazing grace and gift of salvation that is a free gift. It was uh, Jim Elliot who said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. You know, Jesus said about the man who found the treasure in the field that in joy he went and sold all he had to buy the field. And enjoy today, you can receive the treasure that you've been looking for your whole life. It's an offer to you. For all of us here today, we're going to respond around the communion table here this morning as we start the start of this series. And if you can hold off opening your bread for a moment, just let's first pause and evaluate where our treasure is in life at the moment. Let's just bow our heads together. You know, maybe we've been overestimating the value of things in this world and underestimating the value of Jesus. But as we come to this meal today and we, and we eat the bread which reminds us of Jesus' body broken for us and we drink the cup which reminds us that his blood was shed for our forgiveness... This reveals how absolutely priceless the King of glory is and the love that he has for each one of us. He left the glory of heaven.
to come to this world to offer up his perfect life for yours and for my sin. He gave it all for you and me. The most treasured of all heaven and earth gave his broken body, shed his blood in payment so that we could be forgiven and enter in. That's amazing grace. So if you're a Christian today, I pray that as we have this meal in a moment, you, you might have even lost your joy. That this treasure wouldn't be buried under anything else. But today, you just gaze at the beauty of what you have received and the one you have received who has died, was buried and rose again. And just be amazed, give thanks and come and worship and renew your desire and heart and love for him to enter in to this wonderful life of amazing grace. But if you're not a Christian here this morning, before we share, you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, you've never received this amazing grace, this parable calls you to not leave the treasure in the ground, hidden, because God is offering it to you. And so this morning, I just encourage you and God calls you to leave what you're holding on to behind, to let go of your life and to embrace Jesus, the cross and his life and all he has done for you. He's giving you amazing grace, a treasure that will never tarnish or fade or spoil, that lasts forever. And he offers you that today. You can simply just take that and then eat and drink and say thank you. So Lord, we just come and respond this morning to give you thanks for your amazing grace, to thank you, Lord, that you are the greatest treasure pearl of great price that any person can ever meet or see or know and receive today we thank you for the bread and the cup that reminds us of all that you are and done for us we thank you in jesus name amen amen